It is my privilege and joy that we can continue our Bible study about the three cosmic messages, and we have today the subtitle, Fear God and Give Glory to Him. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Fear God and give glory to Him is the message of today. What does it mean to fear God? Why this choice of words? Does God need our glory? Does He need anything from us that we should give Him? And what is this sentence supposed to tell us? So we want to see and give an answer to these questions in this and in the coming presentations. We know that the story of finitude started with a self-deception in Lucifer who thought he could become God. By this was the beginning of the evanescence. And this is not in God's plan and not a part of his creation. That's why he made a plan to remove the perishable from his creation. And he made a plan for this. And in this plan, we are in its final stages. God will create circumstances in this our time through which every currently living person can exchange his dead life with an everlasting life. But in order to do that, man must understand his own state of self-deception. This to know is the hardest and greatest difficulty that God has in saving men. In Revelation 3.17, it says that man is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. While he believes, and this is the tragedy, he believes that he is rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. How can this be? How can that self-deception be so great that you think upon yourself exactly the opposite? And this is one of those themes that present to us our supposed free will in this state. So, to make it even more practical, I put here my picture in order for you to put your picture there as well, because we all have a same root where we come from. We all come from Adam, and we all have, in order to exist, a father and a mother. And all of us are half of our spirit from father, and half of our body from father, and half of our spirit from mother, and half of our body from mother. And so the father calls me his son, and my mother calls me also her son. My father inherits me, my error in my mind, or called sinful nature, the flesh, and my mother gives me the same as inheritance. By this, I can by no means connect to God, but I must connect to my mother. I bind to her, and on my mother's side, I also bind to the spouse. That's the two relationships that are bound on that side, and on the other side, I bind to my father, and all other people are binding on the same place, including the pets. So, we have no choice. We are slaves of Satan because we must be dependent for our love, for our spiritual needs from humans and animals. This is the fallen nature of men, the dead life. And this is represented in the Bible by the five pictures of a state of being. So, this is the incapacity state in which every human being is born. Now, a state cannot be sin. It is used sometimes as sin because it's the source where sin comes out. But in reality, a state can never be sin because sin is an action. So in this picture, in this slide, where is the action of sin? It's very simple. It's the binding. Here, where we bind to humans and to animals, this binding, that is sin. And that is a subconscious binding. It's in the mind, in the spirit only. And our actions just show it, but they are the effect of that connection that is called sin. So, this is our state, and I want to go once again through it so that we are very well aware to be poor means to be cut off from the source of life. God is unreachable for this man. Does he have a free will? Brokenhearted or naked means exposed, without protection. 
Does he have a free will? Captive or wretched means self-destruction, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So Paul, on the basis of the law, could realize his state, and he could cry out, understanding how wretched he was. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Free will? Blind means to be unable to see oneself. Let them alone, Jesus says about the Pharisees. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Free will? Bruised and miserable means to be a slave of others. The ways of Zion do mourn because none come to the solemn feasts. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh, her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. Her adversaries are the chief. Her enemies prosper, for the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. Free will? So, let us be very clear. In this state in which we are born, we are slaves. There is no way to have a free will in this state. So, how can we then be saved? God worked it out. He had to free man from within. That's why he had to beget his human son in Mary. In order to do that, he had to add this humanity to his pre-existent divinity. So Jesus Christ is 100% divine and 100% human. Now his humanity is under the law of inheritance. He had to be 50% spirit from God, his father, and 50% body from God, his father and 50% spirit of mother Mary, and 50% body from his mother Mary. He inherited from his father the right identity, the truth. And by this, he bound to his father in a moment of conception. So here, God made the connection between the human and the divine. Because without this connection, the salvation could not be made. So Christ works together with his father to expel from within himself the error of the Spirit. And on the cross, he cries out, it is finished, because this thing was done. And he died then as a complete man, because the whole man must die. He was flesh and blood, could not inherit the kingdom of God. And he raises up from death, after he has killed the old man, as a total new creation. He is the firstborn son of God, God's new creature, the second Adam, an everlasting life. This life he made available for the individuals that come from the life of Adam. So the life of Adam that got lost, Jesus crucified and created one anew out of it. But this new life cannot come to us by an inheritance, by a law, because it's made by grace. The only way it can come to us is that if every individual should take it himself for himself through faith. So how can this man be saved? Only by a choice given by grace. But this choice that is given by grace, which is accomplished by faith, is not something that was still inherent in a free will, as we must understand. This choice that was given to man in his will, which he accomplishes by faith, is just an addition, a grace of God. So this choice is not something man would have if God would have not made it possible by making the new life and offering it through this one choice to every individual. So if the individual is not choosing this new life. He remains in the old state. But he will only choose this new life when he realizes his state. But you see, Laodicea, the people of the end time, the church of the end time, so to say, are not aware that they need a savior because they believe they have a free will. They believe they can do and choose whatever they want. They don't see that there is only the choice given 
by grace that you must exercise by faith in order to become and have a free will again. So in order to become free and have a free will, we must choose to get out of the deception. But look, I am rich and increased with goods and have no need of nothing. Now what do you want to offer this person? I have this experience uh, since God called me to preach. Whenever I preach to a non-religious community in an in a open setting, or even in the last um, times or years, called to preach to the, to the New Agers, to the esoterics, to the people who are in search, they sit there and they listen. And they listen for two hours, two and a half hours, and sometimes it goes with questions for three hours. And they are spellbound and interested and ask. And you preach in a church, people stay relaxed. They just sit there and you even think, should I say something to them? They know everything. They are full. Why would they come to church? Well, because it's a, an, a right. It's, it's something that they do every weekend. But they don't need to learn anything. They know already everything. What are you there to offer them? Jesus comes to them and says, I counsel thee to buy from me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with thyself that thou mayest see. But this is for a man or for a woman that doesn't realize its state. Worthless. It's worthless. It's like putting the diamonds in front of the pigs. It's nonsense. Because people don't realize their state in which they are. That's why they're so relaxed. It's like the disciples. They have no idea what's going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's why they are relaxed. They have no idea of their state of mind. But they get an idea when they enter into that crisis just a few moments later. So the hardest thing in the salvation of men is that he might be aware of his condition. And for this, God goes the extra mile. It takes years and decades before he has access. How shall he get to them? I'm so thankful that he is full of patience and he goes with humans until he can knock at the door and say, do you see your state? Do you see your state of wretchedness and miserableness and nakedness and poorness and blindness? Do you see it? Because if you go not see it, you will never take the gospel. The gospel is the good news. But who will take it? Why do people reject it? And who crucified Christ? Was it the People of the streets, so to say, those who were unlearned? Was it those who were sick? Was it those who were sinners? Or was it those who were righteous? Those who had the Bible in their hands? Those who, who were saints? Did not they crucify him? Isn't it amazing? that the one that thinks themselves to be righteous are the ones that are most miserable. But they have no way to be saved as long as they don't see their state of being lost. That's why God left nothing out to reach man. He will prove in the judgment that everything he did was to reach the mind of men 
that he might realize his state and take the offer of the gospel. Now, what does God use in order to reach people? It's the unchangeable fundamental law. Without this law, I could never reach out to my patients. The Bible tells us the law was given that we should understand the state in which we are. Without this law, I could not direct anyone to the cross and to the new life of Christ. I would be incapable doing that as a physician. And then I have to know the human being. I must explain to my patients how they function, why they are in this condition of sickness, what brought them there, so that they realize the way and the condition in which they were born, so that when they see their desperate need, I can offer them the salvation, the good news, and then they will take it, because they need it, but they will never take it if they don't need it. So that's why God uses the consequences of self-deception, sickness, crisis, people destroy themselves, people uh, are in conflicts all the time. He uses these consequences, this clear things that you are not having a free will, but you are in total captivity to help man to see his deception. And only when man sees his deception, salvation is possible. So let's go through the means that God uses to save man or to make him aware of his self-deception. So the law of God, nothing can exist or function by itself. Everything must take in order to give because nothing can do anything for itself is the law of God. And God is the beginner of the channel. He's the creator and the cause. And by this, everything works in a circuit. Applying this to the spirit of man, the spirit is a channel. He needs to take. He's dependent on God and on God only. That he might give. On the giving place, he's independent. He shares that what he took from God. God has made this plain in the two tables of stone where he wrote his ten words. The first table is the taking table, and the second table is the giving table. So everything is simple and good. But through the deception that we believe we are a well, not a channel, that we are a God, we give first, because we have no beginning. We don't need to take first, because we start from within ourselves to give in order to receive. From whom? From people and from God and from everywhere, people want to receive. I never saw a problem that the human being had that was not dependent on receiving. Either they did not receive what they needed or they received that what they don't needed, the anti-need. But everything was because of the actions of others, because of that what they receive. They don't see that the law does not Allow that. You take and you give. People don't see the deception that from where they expect to receive, they actually take. Because that is an invisible subconscious thing. It's not known to them. We can only see it by that what people do, how dependent they are from what others are saying or doing, and they must follow that what others are doing. So the law makes very clear and plain. There is never a possibility to be independent. We are a channel. Everything God created must first take, work with that, and do something with it in giving. This is the law, and no one can change it. And knowing that this is the vulnerable thing, Jesus speaks to the people in Luke 14, 25 and 26. And there were with him much people. And he turned and said unto them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sister, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Isn't it amazing what Jesus says? Do this multitude of people that follow him? 
We could also use the word, instead of hate, we could use the word fear. If anyone comes to me and does not fear to be dependent of his father, of his mother, of his wife, of his children, and so on, he cannot be my disciple. Because the law shows that there must be spiritual independence from people. I must hate to be dependent on my wife, on my children, on the dog, the cat, whatever a human have. There is only one spiritual dependency, and that is on God alone. On God alone. That is the law, and no one can change that. And since here is the battle, Jesus makes very clear to his listeners, look, you need to become free agents. But you can only be free when you are dependent on God alone. There is only a free will in the truth, never in the deception. So let's look how things are in our heart, not subconscious. Every human being was made to have only two criteria for his decisions, and that is gain and loss. And to him was given only two decisions, yes and no. There is not more. And now, if one is in the truth, he knows his first action is to take. But he doesn't take for himself, he gives. And loss would be the opposite of giving, not to give or to keep. So he needs to keep, not what he takes, so he remains an open channel. He looks to his own action, but since he needs to take first, he looks to God for his own action. But he needs to take, his own actions are it that make him do decisions, and that is selflessness. So to be in love, in altruism, means I take from God and give and share with others. But now, being in the error, believing I'm a God, you give first because you have no beginning. You are the wellspring of all things and you give in order to receive. That's why when you do not receive or receive the opposite of what your need is or someone takes something away you consider is your own, you get into great trouble because you lose the no. In this deception, all people just look to the actions of others. They believe that it's so good to control the others. No, they just look to others because they can give them something or they can take them something away. That's why they are in total selfishness. They do everything for themselves. Now, let's look to fear and anxiety. And I took anxiety as the negative and the fear as the positive side of saying no. Because we must say no. And we say no because of fear of loss. But now there is one difference. Do I say it, I try to say no to what I can control or to what I cannot control? If it's something I can control, it's the way God made me. But if it's something that I try to control, what I cannot control, then I am in anxiety and lose control. So anxiety arises through the inability to avoid loss. Why can I not avoid loss? Because in the evil eye, I want to control the actions of others. How can I do that? It's an impossibility. So I'm totally unable to avoid loss because others can make me loss. And through this error, I believe that something others could take away from me which belongs to me, my body or my life or whatever. So there are two things that make us be anxious and all the time uh, not feeling well because I want to control others because they can make me loss by not giving me or giving me the, the opposite or by taking something away that I consider is my own. If I am in the truth, then there is fear, which is God-given, that is the ability to avoid loss. Since taking, giving, not giving is my action, I can do them because I am in my own sphere of action. And that's how I am very free to act. I can say no because it's under my control. So we need to fear loss. And if we are in the truth, we want to make gain for God because we are his children, and we want to avoid loss. And to avoid loss means I say no to fear. 
no to loss. And that is what is called fear. So let's look a little bit closer. Anxiety is the attempt to avoid a loss which is not under my control. My life as existence. When I was in my 20s, I got my first panic attacks. And I was very anxious for my life. I wanted to live. Now God put that in me. But why was I worried about something I could not control? I was not aware of my problem. But it really made me hard times, this anxiety. And I said, if I just would come to the age of 60, I would never worry or be fearful again. And I'm almost one year away from that age. But I thank God that he helped me to overcome fear time before. Because he made me understand that it's not my life. I cannot control it. It is in his hands. And it is safe there. But if I try it, to take it out of his hands, I must be anxious. Then anxiety comes because I want to control the life of others. Can I control the life of others? My mother, my father, my child? People are so worried because they cannot control their children when they do the wrong things. I should know. I cannot. So why not leaving it alone? I cannot control the acts of others. I cannot control circumstances. And I cannot control invisible things. But we want to control the invisible things. That's why we take some disinfection things and we believe in the invisible. There is the danger. Now try to control the invisible. How much wisdom is that? And then you think to control the future, to control time. There is no way how you ever can step out of the time. You're only in the present. You neither can go back into the past nor go forward into the future. So why worry? Why wanting to control today what comes tomorrow? It's just because you're deceiving yourself believing you're a god. So in the error, anxiety is a constant companion. And even when people don't feel it, it is still there. It just needs a little trigger. And boom, it will be showing up. So in the error, anxiety is always present. You cannot take it off. It will only always make you afraid when you are try to control that which is not under your control. Now, fear is the ability to avoid a loss which is under my control. Now, you see this stoplight. To stop at the red light, you only do it because you fear. You would not stop if you don't fear. Some people have other fears and then they have to go over the red. But you only can put a stoplight there because you need to avoid loss. And you know if you go over that cross, crossing, then you might make an accident and you die. You might be having a good picture or the police is waiting around the corner and give you a fine. And you stop. You stop out of fear. But you don't feel anything evil. You don't feel anything wrong because it is under your control. You are careful when you're driving. Why? When I drive, the faster I drive, the more careful I become. Because I must avoid the loss. And if it's under my control, it's fine. No fear. Only if I fear that another one might come into me, another car driver might... Then I get anxious. Because I try to control that, what I cannot control. But if I'm just there controlling that, what I can control, I have fear. But no bad feelings, no, um, nothing that makes my body to not function correctly. So out of fear, we don't jump down from the third or the tenth floor. Yes, we even put some things around our balconies in order to not fall over. We do it out of fear. Because we could fall down and die or hurt. So out of fear, we do those fences around so that no one can fall out from his balcony. And then, of course, you blow into a hot soup or tea or other hot drink out of fear to not burn yourself. 
So fear is something that is there and is needed because we must say no to that which is against us, that brings life in danger. But that fear doesn't make a wrong uh, emotion because it's physiological. It's under your control. You don't try to control something that is outside of your control. That's why you feel well in this fear. Because avoiding loss is present in all actions. We must avoid loss. We must go forward. We have a yes and a no in everything. But the no we say for the things we can control will never hurt us, will never make us anything feeling bad. So that's why we want to now see what does Solomon the wisest man from the Bible and from the earth, probably, that lived, told us in the Proverbs about this. But before we see it, we must understand that when he writes, he writes for those who are under grace only. Because only under grace, when you exchange your life with the life of Christ, you can exercise the fear of God. Before, you cannot exercise. You might before, be fearful about God because you might realize that there is an account to give, but you have not the fear of God that is physiological and must be in every human being. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So something evil to fear the Lord, something that the angel that is crying out fear, it's real fear, but it's a fear that saves us that gives us knowledge that has no bad result in an emotion. For that they hate knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. So to hate knowledge is the same as not choosing to fear the Lord. That's not very smart if we have the need for knowledge. I'm so glad God gave me, after my conversion, a, a promise that I am is so very dear to my heart because it says here in uh, Isaiah 48, 17, Thus says the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit. In German it says, that teaches thee that what is necessary, that what counts. Because there is a lot of teaching out there that is not good, that is nonsense. But the teaching that matters is that what God is teaching us. I am teaching you that which to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. So the fear of the Lord is the connection to God from whom you learn, but you can only learn from him while you are connected to him. In chapter 8, 13, in Proverbs, he says, the fear of the Lord is hate evil. Yes, say no. So you hate pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. Now, that's easy to hate in others when you see that they are arrogant or evil and uh, speak lies, and then that's, yeah, we hate that. But the fear of the Lord doesn't hate what others are doing. The fear of the Lord hates the own pride, the arrogancy. That's why it shuns you from evil. It makes you to say no to it because it's a loss. Chapter 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Wow, this is the fear of the Lord makes you wise. That's the Bible verse he gave me. The wisdom that we can have has only one source. That's God. But how can you have that if you're not connected to him, if you're not that one source by which you live? Chapter 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. No sickness. To depart from the snares of death. 
So when you fear the Lord, you say no to those things that are hurtful because you have control over them, because you're connected to God. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. So to have little, but in the fear of the Lord and being connected to God, being his child, is much better than having a lot of treasures but being connected to human, depend on them that they should satisfy your need. And you must have all the time that anxiety, you might lose it. But in the fear of the Lord, you are satisfied with little as much as with much because you have no worries. You are in God. You are free. Now, chapter 15, 33 says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And by the fear of the Lord, man depart from evil. So you see, he repeats the same idea. Saying no to evil is the fear of God. It is a real fear. It's not a supposed, it, it's not something that sometimes people say it's, it's like honoring. No, it's fear to say no to evil. Because you know the result of evil. It is real fear, but it's physiological. We were made to avoid the evil. If we are in the truth, we can do it. But if we are in the lie, we won't avoid it in the others and will be full of anxiety. Chapter 19, 23. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. Isn't that beautiful? To be connected to God is to be satisfied. And you will not be visited with evil because you can say no to it. Let not thine heart envy sinners. Chapter 23, 17. But be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. So that's a continuous state. It's a continuous state of dependency and a continued state of vigilance of how you think. Now, I put that in my own words, because out of what Solomon says, I must know what I know and I believe. To fear God means I must be aware that I'm God-dependent. But to fear God under the conditions we are born in is to realize the inherent error in us and be vigilant over our thoughts because of the danger of self-deception. So vigilance is needed because I know how fast if my self-deception is hurt, it will come out. Fear of the Lord means to not trust in oneself, in our mind or on our logic, because that's terrible. We saw last time that logic is in some cases good and helpful, but it does not help in all of them. Then fear of God means to not rely on people or trust them. Relying on the unchangeable is that which is the fear of God, of the laws and the function of the human being. To use the entrusted goods, the means, the skills in his purpose, and thus increase them. Like in the parable, the talent was given and they had to use it in God's purpose. Not to hide it, not to put it in the ground, not to let it fall apart, but by using it in his purpose, it will increase and will Bring great goods to the one who gave us the means. To fear God means to be ready to give an account at any time of what you have done with the means God has put at your disposal. We will speak about the giving an account in our next presentations because God will ask us all to give an account because we were given reason so that we can use things with accountability, but we only can do this under grace when we are connected to him. Now, to give God the glory, what does that mean? It means to do everything on his behalf. I mean, to do everything in his name, to be complete in harmony with his will. Because we know the will is at the exit of our being, and if we do God's will, and if we are in harmony with him, our character, what we do, will prove that we are connected to him. That is giving God glory. My will is equal to his will. There are no disagreements. 
And that is complete glory to God. And to a knowledge that everything one does or has done comes from Him. That is, only out of His means, His powers, His wisdom, it could be done. So there is no copyright for one who is under grace. Because he doesn't need a copyright. Everything he gives comes from God. God has no copyrights. But we are very proud. We say, well, this is mine. This I have to put a, a stamp on it because I found it out and I have to protect it because this is my own wisdom, my own doings. Friends, it's far away from the truth because none I could ever do if I would have not breath, breath, took a deep breath of God's oxygen and took a water in my mouth and drank water and took food and took his words. How much could I do? There is nothing anyone can do out of himself. That's why he has to be clear. He does everything for God because he uses God's means. That's why he can never glory, say, oh, this is I did, uh, look what I could do because I am so smart. No, no one ever does every, anything out of himself. That's why we give God the glory because we do things out of himself and for the way or for the reason he created us. And by this, he is glorified. We take an example at the end of this presentation. Abraham, by grace through faith, did prove that he feared God. Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now what was the most precious thing for Abraham? It was his son. It was the promised son. The so long fought son. And now God says, give it to me as a sacrifice. Yes, there was a battle. But the fear of the Lord overcame in that battle. Because in Hebrews 11, 17-19, the Bible tells us, by faith, Abraham when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that hath received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So, this is an interesting story could spend a lot of time with it. But just take that out, what helps us to understand the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord was that Abraham was not dependent on his son because he could give him. On what you are dependent, you cannot give. You only can give that what you're independent. That's why at the giving side, we're independent. And if we understand that our heart can only be dependent on God. Then we can give God that which is His and use it. And Abraham proved his faithfulness. He proved that through grace his heart was exchanged and was in the full fear of God to give up that which was most precious to him. But did he lose it? Of course not. He gained it by that what he did. And so it is with everyone. When we are not dependent anymore from our loved ones, for our spiritual dependency, but we are dependent just on God, we can let them do what they want. We, can not need, we don't need to control them. We don't need to be anxious for them because they're God's possession and as we share them as we are there for God's sake together with them we never can lose them Abraham gave 
and he never lost because giving is gain or that we might understand the equation of God and walk after it. Amen.